Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for being brief, Wayne, as, although as he told me on the way out, you've only been alive 44 years. How much is there to say? So, I, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, we begin today by, um, of course, our thoughts, our prayers are with those that have been impacted by the attacks in California last night. We are still gathering details. We don't know all the facts yet. But we certainly have learned some facts that are concerning and weigh on our minds in the aftermath of what we see happening in the world. And so we begin with that acknowledgement and the understanding that we live in a very different world than the one I grew up in, the world you grew up in, the world we had not long ago. And I want to thank you. It's great to be back here with you today. Each time that I return to this gathering, the urgency of the topic at hand has increased since the year before. And I believe that's true this year more than ever before. The threats facing our country and Israel have grown dramatically in recent months, in large part, in large part because our president has placed his own legacy ahead of our mutual security. But of course, when we gather here a year from now, we will have a new president-elect. And depending on, you can clap, this is a. <laughs> depending on who that is, it will have either taken a significant step towards reviving American leadership in the world and in the process advancing Israel's security, or we will have slid even further towards weakness and disengagement. I think one of the things that's become most obvious over the last year is the devastating cost of a foreign policy that lacks moral clarity. Moral clarity means that we stand by our principles and by our commitments. It means we speak up for what's right and speak out against those who are wrong, even if that opens us up to criticism. It means our allies trust us and our adversaries respect us. It's a common, it's, it's, it is common sense that American leadership should look like this. In fact, presidents across both parties have led with moral clarity, from Kennedy to Reagan until now. Now, we have a president who leaves our allies feeling betrayed and our adversaries feeling emboldened. And there is no better example of that happening than what is happening now in the Middle East. I always point out that in the entire region, in the entire Middle East, there is only one pro-American, free enterprise, dem democratic nation. And that, of course, is the Jewish state of Israel. America has strong ties to Israel on cultural, personal, political, and economic levels. It is everything we wish and want the Middle East to look like in the future. Free, tolerant, democratic, peace-loving, and desirous of a better future. And today, Israel stands on the front lines of our civilizational struggle against radical, apocalyptic Islam. And this term, apocalyptic Islam, it is not an attempt to be provocative. It is an attempt to be accurate. It is, a, it is descriptive of the true beliefs of the leaders of both Iran and the Islamic State, that they are living in end times, and that mass genocide is their way to honor God. This enemy hates our two nations, both liberal democracies, both products of the Judeo-Christian tradition, for the exact same reason. And the first requirement of fighting for our common security is standing together. We must not separate the threat to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv from the threat to Paris or London or New York or Washington or even Miami. In fact, I can think of no nation whose security is as closely tied to our own more than Israel. For any time there is daylight between America and Israel, it emboldens Israel's enemies to take action, first against the Jewish state, but then against the rest of the free world. Last month, we saw how quickly terror can spread from the Middle East into the heart of Europe. Many, too many in Washington, fail to understand this. They wonder why we should have trouble ourselves with a small country thousands of miles away. They fail to see the connection to our national security and our moral character. They fail to understand the danger of sending a message to the world that America is an unreliable ally. And so they argue we should distance ourselves from Israel abandon it to its multitude of eager enemies. I believe that deep down, those who wish for this know what it would mean. It would mean we leave Israel's enemies to face alone the terror of rockets falling on their homes, 
the existential threat of the Iranian nuclear weapons program, which President Obama has now exacerbated, the death march of the Iranian proxy Hezbollah on Israel's northern border, an Iranian-backed jihadist who indiscriminately kill Israelis on the streets of Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and yes, even in Judea and Samaria. Those in Washington who wish America would abandon Israel also understand something else. The threat of physical violence is not the only threat Israel would be left to face alone. There is also a growing political and diplomatic threat. In one international forum after another, Israel is attacked by despotic regimes and even free nations throughout Europe that should know better given their histories. It is singled out for condemnation relentlessly, a bullying to which no other nation on earth is subjected. Normally, the United States stops these attacks and shames the attackers. Normally, the United States speaks with confidence and clarity about the regimes that hijack international bodies to distract the world from their own wrongdoing. Normally, but not under Barack Obama. President Obama, and I'm afraid Hillary Clinton, have a very different policy. They call it engagement, but it, what it really should be called is abandonment. Instead of standing up to those who single out Israel, the Obama administration takes the path of least resistance. It throws up its hands and says, in essence, not our problem. Consider this. Just weeks ago, Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abboud began a, uh, Ma Ma Mahmoud Abbas began a speech to a UN body by asking, quote, this is his quote, for how long will this protracted Israeli occupation of our land last, end quote. After 67 years, how long, end quote. As we all know, 67 years ago was 1948, the year of Israel's creation. And so the man who is supposed to be Israel's partner for peace has just said that all of Israel is illegitimate and that the Jewish state is an occupation of someone else's land. Now this is not unusual rhetoric for a Palestinian leader, but what matters is that it should have provoked a harsh condemnation from the United States. But our current president said nothing. By his silence, our government emboldened those who seek Israel's destruction and made ourselves a bystander to a poisonous lie. Similarly, over the last three months of Palestinian terror attacks, our administration has refused over and over again to do anything more than call on both sides for restraint. As if there were no difference between aggression and self-defense, the Palestinian attacks are being incited by lies knowingly promoted about Jewish threats to the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem and spread through a vicious campaign of anti-Semitism in Palestinian media. Or consider the European Union's recent approval of a new trade rule that requires special labeling of products produced in what the EU now considers Israeli-occupied territories. The goal of this is to encourage Europeans to boycott goods from Israel. The rule applies to no other country in the world, not to Russia, who invaded Georgia and Ukraine, nor China, which occupies Tibet. The EU is singling out only Israel. Let's take a step back and realize what this means. Discriminatory laws that apply only to Jews are now being written into European law for the first time in more than half a century. I believe we need a president who is not afraid to call this out for what it is. This is anti-Semitism. Today, anti-Semitism hides behind the label of anti-Israel. We need a president that will call it that. And I will be that president. I will take a very different approach to the United Nations. There will be no more complicity in attacks on Israel. Dictators, rogues, and terror sponsors will be publicly shamed. The United States will leave and defund UN entities that attack Israel or promote anti-Semitism.
And I'll also speak out against anti-Semitism here in America. One important example is the movement that calls itself BDS, for boycott, divestment, and sanction. This coalition of the radical left thinks it has discovered a clever, politically correct way to advocate Israel's destruction. BDS, BDS couches hatred in the language of human rights and social justice. But this movement reeks of hypocrisy. Boycotters do not seek to punish Cuba, North Korea, Iran, Syria, or Russia, all actual human rights violators. Their campaign is only aimed at Israel. They make wild, false accusations in the hopes of inciting so much hatred of the Jewish state, especially on our campuses, that eventually support for Israel will become politically taboo. As president, I will repeatedly and openly call on university presidents, administrators, religious leaders, and professors to speak out with clarity and force on this issue, the same way they speak out against racism. The same way they speak out against racism and other forms of bigotry. I will make clear that calling for the destruction of Israel is the same as calling for the death of Jews. I will bring moral clarity to the White House, but I will also back it with strategic and military strength. When I am commander in chief, I will fortify our alliance with Israel. In doing so, I will send a message to our friends and enemies alike that America is back, that we will never again confuse our adversaries for allies or allies for adversaries. So let me be loud and clear about how I will begin. I will immediately shred this president's disastrous deal with Iran. You know, news reports out of Vienna this week indicate that Iran will not even be required, will not even be required to come clean about its past nuclear work. This makes a bad deal worse. And those who are now rushing to do business with Iran need to know that upon taking office, I will reimpose the sanctions that President Obama plans to waive over congressional objection. The days of giving the Ayatollah of Iran more respect than the Prime Minister of Israel will be over on my first day in office. I will hold Iran accountable for American hostages it has taken and for its arming and funding of terrorist groups and for its arming and funding of terrorist groups like Hezbollah and Hamas. I will impose crippling new sanctions against the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. When I'm president, I will speak out against Palestinian terror in no uncertain terms and I will never confuse the victim for the victimizer. And this means that as part of rebuilding our alliance with Israel, I will put the peace process in perspective. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton have made it the defining feature of the relationship between our two countries. It should not be for the simple reason that Israel currently has no viable partner for peace. In fact, the so-called partner that this administration claims is interested in peace this so-called partner rewards Palestinian terrorists with up to $3,500 for every month they spend in an Israeli prison, which is more than five times the average Palestinian makes per month. They get tens of thousands more upon their release from prison, and the entire level of payment is directly tied to the number of Israelis they have killed. Does this sound to you like a group interested in peace? Some in our own party. Some in our own party, in the news today, have actually questioned Israel's commitment to peace. Some in our own party have actually called for more sacrifice from the Israeli people. They are dead wrong, and they don't understand. They are dead wrong, and they don't understand the enduring bond between Israel and America. Generation after generation of Israelis have struggled and sacrificed to find peace with an enemy seeking only war and death. I know and honor these sacrifices, and I reject those who believe that Israel is an impediment to peace. 
Let me be crystal clear. There is no moral equivalence between Israel and its enemies. And I'll say it again. There is no moral equivalence between Israel and those who seek to destroy her. Understanding that fundamental truth is essential to being the next commander in chief. This is not a real estate deal where two sides argue over money. It is a struggle to safeguard the future of Israel. And as president, I will challenge the real impediments to peace in the Middle East, and I will stand up for Israel. Instead of pressuring Israel to make unreciprocated concessions, I will work with the prime minister on areas of mutual interest. I will finally move our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. I will help ensure that Jerusalem remains the Jewish state's undivided and eternal capital. I will revive the common sense understandings reached in the 2004 Bush Sharon letter and build on them to help ensure Israel. And I will build on them to help ensure Israel has defensible borders, including through its continued control of the Golan Heights. And this is only the beginning of what I will do as president in support of Israel, but it is far from the beginning of my efforts on this issue as a public servant. Throughout my time in the Senate, I have worked to strengthen and deepen our alliance. Just recently, I passed new sanctions against Hezbollah. Last year, I passed a budget amendment to move our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and I fought to require Iran to recognize Israel's right to exist. I've proposed crushing sanctions on Iran for its ongoing support for terrorism and human rights abuses. As Speaker of the Florida House, I pioneered what became a national effort by requiring the Florida Pension Program to divest from companies linked to Iran's terrorist regime. And earlier this week, I introduced a resolution with Senator Kirk to ensure that states like Florida can continue to divest from Iran. I've also led efforts in the Senate to pressure the Palestinian Authority to end its partnership with Hamas. I attempted to defund UN agencies that attack Israel and supported legislation to force Europe to stop its despicable anti-Semitic boycotting of Israeli products. And I've been... And I, and I've been a staunch supporter of our military assistance to the Jewish state, especially the Iron Dome system that has saved countless lives. In fact, these programs have ended, been, ended up benefiting America by leading to the technological innovations now used by the U.S. military itself. In choosing a president, we need to look at what candidates do, not just what they say. Just a few short years ago, many in my own party were trying to derail the post-war consensus about America's role in the world. They will never call themselves isolationists, but that's exactly what they are. I believe those who speak about their pro-Israel views but carelessly support a gutting of our international affairs budget, including assistance to Israel, or who vote against legislation funding U.S.-Israel defense programs, I believe they need to check their priorities. You cannot be pro-Israel while also attempting to eliminate assistance that Israel uses to defend itself. I'd like to leave some time to take your questions, so let me just close with this point. One thing that inspires me about Israel is that in the face of so much adversity, there is no nation that wants peace more. No nation has sown greater restraint towards its enemies. And even as the current administration has turned their back on them in recent years, no people have stood by our nation on issue after issue more than the people of Israel. I encourage all of you to go back and look at the United Nations roll call votes. Time and again, when the interests of America are challenged, Israel is one of the few countries that votes with the United States over and over and over again. Like our own country, the state of Israel is an extraordinary story in the history of the world. 
I believe our nations share a moral foundation and a common moral destiny. And so let us stand with them as they have stood with us. Let our nations together serve as beacons of light in an ever-darkening world. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, we have uh, yeah. nine minutes. Okay. So we have about uh, nine minutes uh, for some questions. And Senator, these are questions that we have uh, uh, curated over the last uh, week or so from our, our members uh, and our attendees across the country. Uh, the, uh, the troubling thing is that you answered about 85% uh, of them in the course of your terrific speech. So we're going to try and uh, uh, find some things that we can address that uh, you haven't touched on. Uh, first of all, obviously, you laid out a very concrete uh, set of proposals and, and, and a vision uh, for your foreign policy uh, as president. Uh, obviously, you need a team to assist you once you become president. Can you share with our group uh, some of the folks that you would consider potentially to be a secretary of state in your administration? Well, I would think, <laughs> I think it's uh, premature to actually begin to cite specific individuals. Suffice it to say that I do believe in, our, in the Republican Party and across the conservative movement. We have a handful of, of, of new voices that are very strong on the issues that I care deeply about. And it's important, for example, the Secretary of State oftentimes, if you appoint the wrong person, becomes captive to the Foreign Service and the professional bureaucracy of the State Department. People that have been there for long periods of time who think they can wait you out, sometimes flat out ignore your orders, or in the implementation, undermine the directives of the President in the White House. So the most important thing you need in a Secretary of State is a strong leader who becomes the president's representative at the State Department, not the State Department's representative to the president. In that context, it has to be someone that shares our view that America, that the world is a safer and better place when America is the strongest country in the world. The best. And when people hear me say that, they say, well, does that mean military engagement? I think they underestimate the amount of power and influence America has well beyond simply its military capabilities. Most certainly, our military capabilities are important. But they are not the only source of power America has. America is the only nation on Earth that can convene collective action. What you're seeing in the Middle East now is an example of it. We have not spent enough time describing to the American people the true nature of ISIS. And our next Secretary of State needs to be someone that understands it. ISIS has a monthly publication. It's called Dabiq, D-A-B-I-Q. It's an online publication. I don't encourage you to subscribe, because then people <laughs> might wonder about you. But, but Dabiq is not some name they pulled out of a hat. Dabiq is the name of a village of a small city in Syria. And the reason why they named it after that city is because according to their interpretation of, of, of prophecy, they believe that there is going to be a final apocalyptic showdown between the West and Islam in the city of Dabiq. They believe that it is their calling to trigger this apocalyptic showdown. And therefore, when they recruit fighters, what they are recruiting them for is to be a part of this army that is going to trigger this final showdown between the West and Islam, that Islam will win, and then the whole world will be governed under the, their set of rules, led by the emergence of the 12th Imam, the, the, the Mahdi, their, their messianic figure. Why is this important for us to understand? And why is that important for the next Secretary of State to understand? Because when you understand it, you realize these are not people you can negotiate with. These are not people that are going to go out of business. These are not individuals that are disgruntled or unemployed. These are not people that are upset because American troops were deployed in Iraq. These are individuals with an apocalyptic vision of the future. And they will not stop until they feel they have succeeded in triggering this apocalypse. It, by the way, is similar to the views held by the Ayatollah in Iran. And so when people that have an apocalyptic vision of the future are growing in their capabilities in the case of ISIS or trying to acquire a nuclear weapon in the case of Iran, you understand why it is that in many cases diplomacy and engagement does not work and in the case of ISIS has no chance of working. We face a very fundamental choice. Either they win or we win. There is no other possible outcome. And The next Secretary of State better be someone that understands this. Uh, if I can, I'd like to sort of probe a little bit into sort of having you sort of share with us how you philosophically approach 
uh, an issue. Obviously, the presidency, you, you know, it's not the easy decisions that are important, it's the tough decisions. And uh, you've been criticized by some of your opponents because you've advocated uh, the removal of Assad in Syria. Uh, others within the, the, the party have opposed taking out Saddam Hussein. They've opposed uh, removing uh, Gaddafi. Um, as president, how would you weigh the challenges and the balance uh, between the issues of, of human rights versus stability? Well, in fact, the, the bigger issue is you need to have foresight about what these things will mean if you do nothing about them. And Assad is an example of it. Um, so the uprising against Assad, we didn't start the uprising against Assad. The uprising against Assad were everyday Syrians. Not jihadist initially, it was largely made up of everyday Syrians, mostly Sunnis, who rebelled against an Alawi, which is basically a minority within the Shia minority, that they felt had been brutal and discriminatory towards them. And so they rose up. Some of them were Syrian army defectors that were a part of that effort. When that uprising began, I repeatedly warned that if we did not identify non-jihadists that we could help empower, then the vacuum would be created in the aftermath of the civil war, or in the midst of the civil war, and that vacuum would be filled the way vacuums are always filled in the Middle East, by radical jihadists made up largely of foreign fighters. And that's exactly what happened. The non-jihadists were either defeated, killed, or exiled. The only groups that were growing were the, non, uh, or the jihadist groups. Initially, Jabhat al-Nusra was actually the group that was growing the fastest. And then ISIS really took off. And the result is that vacuum has now been filled by this group and has used Syria as an operational space to spread into Iraq, to grow now in Libya. They're beginning to grow their influence in Afghanistan significantly, conducting attacks in Lebanon. They're coming after Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, Egypt. They've been very clear about the global caliphate they want to establish. As long as Bashar al-Assad is in power, you're going to have in power two things. Number one, you're going to have in power an Iranian puppet who serves not just as a conduit to Iranian influence in the region, but someone who has actively facilitated anti-Israeli, anti-American terrorism in that region. But the second thing you're going to have in place is an irritant. As long as Assad is in power, you're going to have in place someone that creates the conditions for the next ISIS to pop up, for the next ISIS to emerge. So this simplistic notion that leave Assad there because he's a brutal killer, but he's not as bad as what's going to follow him, is a fundamental and simplistic and, and, and dangerous misunderstanding of the reality of the region. As, as long as Assad or someone like Assad remains in power, not only does Iran have a proxy state that they control, but also it will serve as an irritant that will allow the next radical Sunni Islamist group to rise up and replace what ISIS is today. And so you need a president with a foresight to understand this, a president that doesn't just understand what's in front of you, but understands what it's going to turn into in two, three, or five years if you don't do something about it. And that's why I repeatedly warned about what was happening in Libya. I repeatedly warned about the premature withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan. I repeatedly warned about what would happen in the aftermath of the drawdown in Iraq, and I repeatedly warned about what would happen in Syria. Time and again, I warned about these things before they happened. And I think what it shows is insight and foresight into what can happen on these issues when America fails to lead. Right. Um, we've got one minute left. Uh, let me ask you a quick question to follow up on your, your comments about uh, uh, the money that the Palestinian Authority uses to support uh, uh, terrorists and the families of terrorists. Would you condition, on, we give hundreds of millions of dollars to the Palestinian Authority, would you condition further U.S. aid specifically on uh, a cessation of them f funding uh, uh, yes, these, but not these just terrorists? That. And a absolutely, but not just that. It's, it, obviously, that is an at atrocious fact that most Americans are not even aware of, but that's just the beginning of it. What about the indoctrination of children as young as, as, young as possible? <laughs> when you have a governing authority whose school curriculum is largely built on instilling in their children the hatred for Jews and how glorious it is to kill Jews, how can you possibly hope for peace? When you have an organization that actively teaches children that killing people because they are Jewish is a glorious thing that should be held up as, as, a, uh, as an attribute, how could you possibly consider them a, a partner for peace? So I would say absolutely the payment to terrorists, but not just the payment to terrorists. Israel has no partner for peace right now in this conflict. I wish it were different, and so do the Israelis. And so in the absence of a partner for peace, what we must ensure is stability and security until hopefully at some point in our, in our history in the future, perhaps a partner will emerge, but we don't have one now. Great.
Senator, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Big round of applause. Thank you.